Hey PCS, uh, today we've got Joseph Spirit from Atlassian, uh, he's a developer at Atlassian. Um, Atlassian's one of our sponsors this year, um, as they have been for the past uh, few years as well. Uh, we're very happy to have him here uh, give a talk, um, which is about cloud infrastructure. So let's give a round of applause. Alright, hi everyone. Um, hello, anyone watching on the live stream here? Um, so thank you for coming along to my talk tonight. Um, what I would like to do tonight is talk a bit about the kind of work that I do day to day and the kinds of systems that I spend my time working on and thinking about in my role working in cloud infrastructure at Atlassian. Um, despite this popularity in industry and uh, as much popularity in industry, actually building the kinds of applications and software that run on the cloud or the infrastructure that support those is not something you really get any training at at university, at least in my experience. And so outside of the kind of experience you might get via something like internships or maybe personal projects, it's a really hard thing as a student to get insight into. So I guess first off, who am I? Um, I'm Joseph, I'm a developer at Atlassian and I've been there for a bit over three years now. I graduated from software engineering at UQ in 2017 and then in 2018 started with Atlassian as a grad. And I actually did an internship with Atlassian a year before that. So, who are Atlassian? Um, well, we're a software company with offices all around the world, but we were founded and have, I think, still our largest office in Sydney, Australia. More specifically, our offices are on George Street in the middle of Sydney, here and here. Um, or even more specifically, inside they look a little bit like this. Obviously, COVID has changed things a little bit. Um, I worked from home for about 11 months, I think, before only really going back into the office um, about three or four weeks ago. Um, but this is what the offices used to look like and still mostly look like. So what do we do? We make software for teams. Um, we have a whole bunch of products aimed at software development teams, but also at teams more generally. If you work in software at the moment, or have done in the past, you may have used one or two of them already. Um, possibly by choice, possibly not by choice. We make Jira, Confluence, Trello, Bitbucket, and a bunch more like Opsgenie and Status Page. Um, I will give more on this at the end, but we are also hiring right now. Um, in particular, we are in the middle of hiring for our summer internship program. What a coincidence. Um, so right now, that's for next summer, over like the end of this year and the start of next year. Um, we look for penultimate year students for our internship program, so if that's you, please go and have a look at our website. Um, and see the various roles we offer. We're hiring for interns like across the board, um, including back-end and front-end dev, product management, analytics, security, site reliability engineering, design and UX research. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of specialties, not just the kinds of things that I'm talking about tonight. Um, but I will come back to that at the end of the talk. So cool. Um, I'm going to talk about the cloud tonight. You may have heard people talk about the cloud in really grandiose terms about like revolutionizing computing or whatever. And yes, people get a bit silly about this sometimes. Um, there's like a lot of buzzwords, but it is true that over the last 15 or so years, um, the way that the world has built software has really quite fundamentally changed. Um, one thing you may have heard about the cloud is the idea that the cloud is just someone else's computer. Um, and that is more or less true for a certain definition of someone. Um, back in the olden days, the before times, the companies might have had a rack of servers on site where they'd host their website or the software they use internally like email servers, IRC chat and source code management or something. A more sophisticated company might have bought space in a data center somewhere. Um, but the fact is more and more companies now rely on web applications and the overhead and inefficiency of doing it this way has become a bit of a problem for them. To do this all yourself, you have to first buy or rent the hardware, you have to hire people who know how to run that hardware, you have to fix the hardware when it breaks, you have to buy licenses for all the software you want to use, you have to hire someone who knows how to install that software and keep them around in case there's a security vulnerability they need to upgrade for. Most companies these days, especially non-technical ones, would rather just pay someone else to run software on their computers. And so as a result of this, there are now a whole multitude of companies whose business model is being that someone else in the someone else's computer. So rather than selling server hardware or a software package to run on your own server, um, you, as the provider of this software, do the hard parts. You run the hardware or you pay yet another someone else to run the hardware. 
um, you build and run the software, and your customers just pay you a subscription and they open up their browsers and get to work. Um, this business model is most commonly known as software as a service or SaaS. Um, so when people talk about cloud, that's often what they mean. They mean SaaS software. And I've got up on the screen right now a, a foolproof three-step plan to make yourself a billionaire. Um, most new tech companies um, these days are running something approaching a SaaS business model, but it is also a big part of the business model for larger companies as well. Um, so us, like Atlassian, we have a whole bunch of SaaS products that we run, um, including Jira and Confluence Cloud, Bitbucket and Trello, but there is an industry-wide move in this direction. For example, you used to buy a new version of Microsoft Office every three years, and they might even ship it to you in a box. But now you buy Office 365, it's a SaaS product, you get web apps as well as desktop apps, um, consumer services, like even something like Gmail is kind of effectively SaaS as well. Um, sometimes it's ad supported rather than subscription. Um, so I've got these three easy steps to making a billion dollar SaaS company. You have to sell someone a subscription to something, you have to go build some web apps and host them or something, and then customers point their browsers at mycoolsasapp.com and get to work, and then you're a billionaire. As you might expect, all three of these steps are really non-trivial. Um, but tonight I'm not going to teach you how to do one or three, I'm only re really going to talk about two. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what it means to build and design web apps in a way that makes sense for the cloud. So it's time for the buzzwords. Um, so we're going to talk about building and running 12-factor microservices with DevOps at web scale using MongoDB. So not the last part, I'm not going to talk about MongoDB under any circumstances. <laughs> I will not be talking about that. Um, okay. um, so yes, look, cloud web development is a really trendy area, and as such, there are more buzzwords involved in it than I could even list in an hour, much less explain, um, with extremely variable levels of how much they actually mean anything versus being just marketing hype. Um, but what I am going to describe is the way that we build cloud software at Atlassian, which is built around the idea of deploying microservices fitting a particular pattern made famous by a book slash website called the 12 factor app. I will explain what I mean by both of those terms, um, but first, please keep in mind the cardinal rule of software development. This is not the way to do things, it is a way to do things. Um, this is the way that I am probably most familiar with and it's a way that's worked out pretty well for us, but other companies operate in totally different ways and can still be completely successful. Um, so when I talk about a web app as a microservice, what do I actually mean? Um, well, firstly, when I talk about a web app, I'd be willing to bet that everybody in this room has interacted with a web app at some point today. Um, a web app here is just any kind of server program you run on, you could run it over your computer, but probably on some other server, um, and all it has to do is serve requests via the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, which is kind of the building block of the web. It might respond to requests that a user makes by returning them an HTML page that gets rendered in their browser and then they get a nice website. Or it might provide an application programming interface or API that a user or another program might make requests to and receive some kind of structured data back, maybe as um, JSON or some sort of data format. Um, these requests could do anything. Um, the simplest case is probably just serving a static website, but they could offer all kinds of functionality, like. Um, you might have an e-commerce site where you try to buy graphics cards before the crypto miners get them. And the web server would have APIs that might allow retrieving the amount of stock of a particular product um, or keeping the state of a customer's shopping cart. The user interacts with this web app, but crucially, they interact with this server here by their browser or whatever, but they don't really care what happens behind that. Um, there could actually be not just one server here, but a whole bunch of them providing this functionality. An initial layer might just be some sort of proxy or something. So when I talk about microservices, this is basically exactly what I mean, um, where rather than having one big server ho holding everything, you have a whole bunch of them. Um, so first, first off, I've kind of changed the diagram a little bit. Um, the, this initial proxy service that people talk to is probably not one physical server or even one virtual machine. Um, it's probably a collection of identical ones and users will just talk to one of them at random, maybe based on domain name resolution. Um, the point of that is that having multiple servers, well, number one, you can change how many of them you have, you can scale them up or down, depending on the number of requests you're getting in. 
So that means you can adapt when the crypto miners find your site and like spam you with a billion requests. You can scale up rather than falling over and getting DDoSed. Um, and number two, if one of those web servers fails, there's more around to replace it and you can just spin up a new one without actually interrupting anyone's traffic. This idea is called horizontal scaling um, or auto scaling when you kind of do it automatically based on like the number of requests or whatever. So behind this initial layer then, you might have many, many web applications which, much like the initial web proxy, may be horizontally scalable but perform different functions. And kind of the key to this is that they all talk to each other over HTTP. Like this like hypothetical robot that talks on an API, these are all just doing the same kinds of requests amongst each other as from the initial user to the server. Um, maybe the first one in the chain is like an authentication service that checks if a user should be allowed to do the thing they've asked for, then it gets pointed a number of different things depending on the request, like they've asked to check the stock of an item, it goes to a service in charge of that. Or maybe it's raising a support request and there's a separate service for doing that. Um, you might have some services that aren't in this main request flow at all and just like trigger background jobs for like stock taking or something. Um, so microservices here are really defined in opposition to the idea of monolith development. With monolith development, which was really the most common pattern for web app design for most of the history of the web, you would build one big web app that contains all of your functionality, doing authentication, your commerce site functionality, your support portal, everything. But there are some ways that that model can fall short, particularly when you're running in the cloud. In a monolith, all of your functionality is very tightly coupled together. You can't change just part of it without changing the whole thing. You can't horizontally scale just the web proxy part or just the commerce site part. It's all or nothing. And if you need to deploy a new version of your web app, you need to redeploy the whole thing. And even worse, if you're a really big organization, you have a whole bunch of different teams that own different pieces of functionality, they're probably going to end up starting to bump into each other and make conflicting changes because they're all working on the same thing. Microservices, on the other hand, you have lots of web apps where each one has a single clearly defined responsibility. This means each one of them can be mostly independent. You can run them on different virtual machines and horizontally scale just the components you need to. You can deploy bug fixes or changes to only the component that needs that change. And it means that you can have a small team own each component and they only really need to coordinate with each other when the API between them, called their contract, changes. As I kind of mentioned before, none of this means that microservices are necessarily better. This is really an extremely contentious topic, um, and expressing a strong preference either way is liable to make hacker news very mad at you. The industry kind of went through a whole cycle of this, like deciding whether microservices are the future of everything, and we need to convert everything to microservices now, um, followed by a backlash arguing that they're just pointless and it's all just cargo calling, it's, it's no point. So, I mean, once again, that cardinal rule, it's a fairly standard industry hype cycle. Um, the answer to the question, which way is the right way, is not really an objective one. It depends a lot on context. Very reductively, I would say that it is probably true for most small companies that splitting your code base up into microservices is unlikely to make a lot of sense. Um, the benefits you get in terms of division of ownership and independent scalability really only become evident when you have a large team building something or you're serving like a large number of requests. Um, at Atlassian, we have been around since way before the cloud was really even a term. In the last probably eight or so years, we've shifted very heavily towards this microservice style of development. But we still really have a bit of a hybrid model because we still have monolith code bases for some of our products that existed, you know, 20 years, 20 years ago. We did spend a fairly, fairly large amount of effort making those monoliths run kind of like microservices, which is a really complicated thing to do when they were built as like run yourself apps you put on that server rack in the corner 20 years ago. Um, it's really important to note here, though, that just splitting your code up into lots of pieces will not make it better and will not actually give you any of the benefits that I mentioned. You really have to pair that with a good set of design principles. And one expression of such principles comes from the book slash website called The 12 Factor App. Um, that site documents 12 key principles or factors to follow when designing microservices as web applications. I'm not going to dive deep into all of them. Um, the site is 12factor.net and it's a pretty great resource. Um, it lays out exactly what each of the 12 factors are and why you want to use them. Um, but there are a few ideas derived from the 12 factor app that I'd like to mention that are really relevant when you're developing web apps on the cloud. 
Number one, microservices should be stateless. That means no persistent state should be kept either in memory or on disk in the virtual machine your app runs on, which is sometimes called nodes or instances in, in microservice terminology. In the cloud, Amazon or Google or Microsoft can and will shut your virtual machines down without warning you, and that isn't some kind of major failure for them, that's just Tuesday. Anything that needs to stick around that you can't afford to lose, like customer data or something, um, needs to be stored in an external backing database service. Second, um, microservices should scale horizontally in the manner that I described before. You should run multiple independent copies of your service and scale them up and down automatically to handle load. Being stateless is actually kind of a prerequisite to this, and it means that if one instance or one virtual machine of your service stops, your app doesn't go down, things keep working. The final one I want to mention is that you should make use of continuous deployment, which is to say, Rather than deploying to the cloud by running some bash script off your laptop, you should have your code compilation, testing, and deployment managed by a separate server. There's a whole bunch of software that does this, like Jenkins or Travis, or deploy some Atlassian products, Bamboo or Bitbucket pipelines. Um, you should generally pair this with having some kind of testing or staging environment that you deploy your application to before you run it in production with actual customers. In the real world, there is a lot to consider when designing microservices, but one good thing about them is that they're really trendy, so there are a billion blogs and pieces of documentation online that disagree with each other about, about things um, that you can use to kind of learn about them. Okay, so I've talked a bit about web apps. Um, as a cloud developer, we can apply these principles. We can make a SaaS product that's gonna make us all billionaires. Mission accomplished. But, like, we've talked at a high level here about building web apps that will run on the cloud but we've been super vague about what it actually means to deploy them onto the cloud, like virtual machines and managed databases and DNS and load balancers. Where are we supposed to get those things from? Who's gonna make sure they keep running as intended? This is where the cloud infrastructure part of it enters the picture. So I've talked a bit about what it means to develop for the cloud, where the cloud we kind of defined as this SaaS or software as a service business model. But we can actually broaden our definition of the cloud a bit and we can kind of split it into three very, very rough layers or categories. So below that SaaS or software as a service I talked about before, at the very base level, you have infrastructure as a service. A, an infrastructure as a service provider would like own physical data centers, and they would handle the low level stuff that you need to keep those services working. As a consumer of an IaaS service, you get virtual machines and networking constructs that you can create and destroy by the press of a button without having to think about things like, what if my hard drive fails? Um, so Amazon, Google, and Microsoft are both, are all uh, infrastructure as a service providers with their Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, and Amazon Web Services. Um, slightly higher level than this, there are PaaS or platform as a service providers, and they all abstract away things like virtual machines, and to some extent, the complexities of networking, and provide you as a consumer with a simpler interface. You still have to write the software you want to run, plus some kind of configuration, but the provider figures out how to turn that configuration into the concrete infrastructure as a service level components that you need, and deals with sort of setting all of that up. An example of a fully managed pass might be something like Heroku, although this line gets very blurry because Amazon, Google, and Microsoft <coughs> all provide services that blur the line between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Um, and finally, we have SaaS, which we've already talked about a bit. Um, SaaS providers host everything for you. You just pay them some money. You open a web browser or a phone app to use it. So the people developing SaaS products? Yes. Um, would that be like a job? Yes, so that is, yes, so, um, so yeah, so I think I said, um, you just give us your program and config, a great way to bundle that program and config would be something like Docker. Um, and I will talk a little bit very soon about how Atlassian does it, and surprise, it does use Docker. Um, <laughs> yes, so if you're someone developing one of these software as a service products, like the ones that Atlassian makes, you rely on the services in the lower two layers here, um, both in-house services, and external vendors like Amazon Web Services. So, okay, so what does this look like at Atlassian? I'd like to talk, really focusing on that middle layer here, PaaS. 
or more specifically what it's like to be in that middle layer between the providers of the basic infrastructure on one hand and the cloud developers writing 12-factor microservices on the other. Um, so this is what those layers look like at Atlassian. Um, most Atlassian developers, they work at the SaaS layer. They build microservice web apps following 12-factor principles that power our products, Jira and Confluence and so on. To run those products, we need underlying infrastructure as a service. Atlassian used to rent data center space ourselves, um, but these days we rely basically on Amazon Web Services for that. In the middle though, we have a whole bunch of tooling that we built in house, um, and that's what I work on in our cloud infrastructure department. Specifically, I work on building and maintaining an internal platform as a service that we call Micros, um, like a microservice, um, which interfaces with Amazon and which Atlassian developers in turn rely on to build the SaaS applications that we sell um, without having every one of those developers needing to have a really deep knowledge of Linux, Sys administration, or AWS. So I spend my days doing various things to let developers in the rest of the company operate more efficiently by giving them this intermediate paths to hopefully make their lives easier. Um, so they don't need to know all the internal details of AWS. They don't need to understand how to configure networking for EC2 virtual machines so that things can actually talk to them, or any of the million other things that AWS offers. Instead, my team and some other infrastructure teams, we need to dive deep on that stuff, and our devs just need to interact with the platform that we build. So if I'm a developer, like an Atlassian developer here, what does interacting with this microsystem actually look like? in my day to day. So I kind of need to do three things to get my service running on Micros. So number one, I need to write some code. And that's, that's kind of, that's a fair, fairly important part of the job. And I need to bundle it as a Docker image. Docker would be a whole other talk in and of itself. Um, it's a fairly common industry thing at this point. It's definitely something that's worth learning about. I don't know if there's anything at uni that will teach it at this stage. There certainly wasn't when I was here. Um, but for the moment, we can really just think about it as a way to package our code so we can run it wherever we like. Um, then I need to make a configuration file using like the YAML data format, which we call a service descriptor, um, which is a high level configuration of how you want your application to run. And this also lets you configure things like backing resources, like if you need a database or a cache or queues or stuff attached to your service, you can kind of declare them here. And then finally, I need to make um, I need to use a CLI tool, or more likely a continuous deployment build plan that uses the CLI tool in order to apply the deployment, which automatically gets things put up and creates everything I need in the cloud. So, cool, you've got yourself an application running on AWS. It'll automatically be configured with sensible security settings. It'll have logging and alerting set up for you. It'll automatically be connected to its backing database or whatever. Um, Micros is pretty central to how products run, but it's only one part of our PaaS architecture here. There are a whole bunch of other teams as well, and I'll mention a little bit about them later. Also, just to bring back that cardinal rule that I mentioned early on, this is a way to operate in the cloud. It is not the way. There are a whole bunch of other ways that companies might uh, work with the cloud. They might have developers directly interact with infrastructure as a service features in AWS, Google, or Azure. This is probably more common at small companies. They might have a dedicated operations team or a site reliability engineering team who take the code and set everything up. Or they might use an off-the-shelf PaaS layer or some kind of semi-managed layer from their provider, cloud provider like Amazon Elastic Container Service or Google Kubernetes Engine. None of these ways are wrong. It depends a lot on the company's processes and size as to what will work. Um, having an in-house platform does have some benefits, so let's take a look at what developers get out of this. And so now I would like to show you the one thing in this talk that requires sound to work, um, which is 30 seconds of a two-minute YouTube video that kind of went viral last year. Um, so why build this platform? Why not just give every team an AWS account and let them interact directly? Well, let me show you the first 30 seconds of this YouTube video, um, which will give you some idea as to why just pointing at teams and saying good luck has some issues. There's a key, easy to, and a red ship in Caitlin to glue. Fixed one of your own, like Zillow, Fax, and Workville, and work with them privately too. Detect an inspector, a trusted advisor, got me no Gorilla, what's 3D and data? The pipeline of data sync app, mission app sticker, you can use to believe me, but not. App stream, time stream, augmented AI, auto scaling, and amplify a direct connector, just connect, configure RDS. These are the major services of AWS. Okay. 
So AWS has a lot of services and a lot of them are really complicated. Um, <laughs> interacting with AWS is really, really complicated and it is virtually impossible for one person or even one team to understand all of them. Um, on the other hand, with the Micros platform that we built, you can go from nothing to a Hello World app in the cloud in under five minutes. And that will give you horizontally scaled compute, a backing database, DNS name resolution. Um, this kind of thing is very useful in our internal shipper hackathons, for example, because not always having to run your hackathon demo off of your laptop is very nice. Um, but yeah, so it's really complicated. You don't need to have AWS experts on every team in order to deploy and build cloud applications. We have seen a bunch of other benefits as well, though. Um, because we don't just give developers the tools to deploy their web apps, we also give them the tools to monitor them. Rather than having developers just throw code over a wall to some operations team, we apply a philosophy called you build it, you run it. The team that writes the code is the one responsible for running it. When it goes down, they get alerted and they have the best understanding of what it is doing because they wrote the code. The platform helps make this easy for you by giving you the logging and the monitoring and the alerting tools to figure things out when they do go wrong. We also see a lot of the benefits of centralization here, which is probably only really relevant at larger companies. Um, we can build platform level features once and then they get shared by everyone rather than having every team build their own version of some way of doing things. Um, and finally, we get some, there's the carrot, but there's also the stick. Micros is an opinionated platform. It is only for 12-factor microservices. You must make your service stateless and you can only build web applications that serve HTTP on port 8080. Enforcing these restrictions gives us the ability to offer a whole bunch of stuff for free, like automatically preventing whole classes of security bugs because you can't open whatever ports you want, so you can't have any bugs related to that. Um, and it also helps us make sure that services meet compliance standards and the like. So great, I'm a cloud developer at Atlassian. I get to focus on building microservers and not on debugging AWS. Mission accomplished. But again, not really. We've See what it looks like for a developer to build for the cloud via this intermediate platform as a service layer. But we still haven't really looked at what it's like to be in that cloud infrastructure layer, sitting between the cloud provider and the application developers. So let's go deeper. Um, developers working in cloud, infra in cloud infrastructure at Atlassian do their best to make operating microservices as seamless as possible. I've used a matrix analogy on this slide, which is not really that accurate, because while we do try to make people's lives easier, we're not really trying to hide the cloud from them. Um, it means they don't have to go as deep into it, but they're still running on the cloud, so you will still see its weirdness. Although, I should make a critically important note here, which is that the matrix is directly relevant to my day-to-day -day job, because the first and, of course, only matrix film was shot in Sydney. And there are a lot of scenes that show right outside the office I'm working, I work in every day, and I'm pretty sure you can see the building itself in the film. Um, so that's just a very important note. Um, the question on this slide at the end here, so what does a cloud infrastructure developer do, is a bit of a silly one because like, it depends completely on exactly what team they're on, how the company they work at uses the cloud, and also on what day of the week it is. Um, at Atlassian, we rely on AWS for all the basic infrastructure as a service components, and what we use, what we provide is used by other developers in the companies to build SaaS applications. But even in that middle layer, there are a whole bunch of teams with different responsibilities. So just to go through a few of those, we have teams responsible for core infrastructure, the ones that set up AWS accounts that we use, or which manage the underlying networking to give us IP addresses for things, because IPv4 will not go away. Um, and making sure that everything can actually talk to what it needs to, or teams which operate the continuous integration, continuous deployment tooling that we ourselves use. At a level above this, we have the teams that sit kind of very firmly in that PaaS layer, orchestrating those underlying constructs from AWS and our own teams to make them accessible to others. And this is where my team fits in. The Micros PaaS provides a compute platform and orchestration for microservices. We also have specialist teams that manage particular kinds of backing resources for microservices, like teams that specialize in Postgres databases, or SQS queues, SQS being simple queuing service for queues that are not always simple. Um, things that hook into this Micros orchestration engine so developers and the rest of the company can use them. And then finally, we have teams that build on top of that orchestration to provide features that are common across all the things we make. So some teams manage what we call sidecars, which is uh, extra Docker containers that you run alongside your microservices to provide functionality like 
automated authentication logic. So everyone doesn't need to write their own authentication code, they just add this sidecar to their, their Micros configuration and, it, and a set of rules and it does it all for them. Um, we also have teams that build more complicated ways to orchestrate deployments for our larger products and teams which manage things like our Splunk setup for monitoring and logging and so on. Cool. So I am right in the middle there, helping other ICM devs summon the lower level pieces of the cloud into the right shapes. So what do I do every day? There isn't really a typical day, but I will try and break down a few common themes in the kind of things that I do. So first off, and the most shocking one, is that I write code sometimes. Um, I know, shocking, my title is developer. Um, Micros is a PaaS that lets you deploy applications, but Micros itself is also a microservice, and it's deployed on Micros. That's what I mean with the inception bit here. It's deployed on itself, so that means that in my day-to-day, -day, I actually get a lot of the benefits of the PaaS that I talked about before. When I'm working on adding new features to the platform, like something AWS just released, um, or fixing bugs, I get to apply all of those 12-factor microservice principles. There is kind of a natural question that follows from this. Is, is that too much Micros in your Micros? Micros depends on Micros. Then what do you do if Micros goes down? Um, the answer to that is we have a bootstrapping process, but those kinds of failure scenarios are a really important part of cloud development, um, especially true in infrastructure, but even for microservice devs as well. You really have to think about things like, what happens if the network suddenly disappears? What if my virtual machines suddenly get killed? What if some critical dependency is just suddenly not there? Um, I make code contributions across a number of different code bases and microservices that my team owns. Most services at Atlassian use Java or Kotlin on the back end and JavaScript or TypeScript on the front end. My team has components across quite a few tech stacks for various reasons, which means that I end up swapping between languages quite a lot. I work fairly regularly with components written in Node.js and TypeScript, Java, Kotlin, Golang, and Python. Um, this is not the normal Atlassian experience. Um, I don't actually mind that because it does help me stay a bit fresh across them, but it is also really important to note that like, it is not important to know all these languages. Like, I definitely had not used either Go or Kotlin before I joined Atlassian, but you kind of pick, you kind of pick it up as you go. Um, there's a meme that has a bit of truth to it. Um, a lot of infrastructure stuff, actually. Um, we have some microservices that do provide stuff and also some stuff that runs on like every EC2 host. Um, we used to have things written in C for that, um, which was worse. Um, yeah, so there's a meme that I think has a bit of truth to it about web development, which says that web development is taking JSON and turning it into different JSON. For me, the JSON that I most need to turn things into is the kind that will let me interact with AWS. Um, so I spend a fair bit of time looking at AWS documentation and writing code that interacts with the AWS APIs for services like um, Elastic Compute EC2 for virtual machines, cloud formation orchestration, virtual private cloud for networking stuff, simple queue service for those queues that aren't simple, and S3 object storage. Um, but all up, I don't really spend the majority of my time coding. It depends a bit on the week, but when I'm not coding, I am often hitting AWS with a hammer until it works good. Um, we have to maintain a whole bunch of fixtures for the platform to work. So we need things like virtual private clouds and IP address subnets, so that when someone deploys a microservice, it has an IP address and it can actually talk to things. Um, we make use of an industry concept here called infrastructure as code. Um, which is an idea that ar arises from the problem that if you went and set everything up by going around and clicking buttons on the AWS console web interface, and then you make a mistake or you accidentally delete something, you've got no good way of getting that back. Um, instead, you should describe things the way you, you should describe the way you want things set up in some sort of code or configuration file, and then you can just reapply that code to get it back to the way you want it. Um, this also lets you keep your infrastructure under version control, which is nice. There are a whole bunch of infras code solution systems out there. We make heavy use of Ansible, but there are tools like Chef, Puppet, and Terraform that do more or less the same thing, and some of those see usage digitalizing as well. We also make heavy use of an AWS service called CloudFormation, which lets you specify the things you would like made in AWS as JSON or YAML config. 
Unfortunately though, the nature of the cloud is that things don't always go smoothly, which is why I spend a fair amount of time on investigating things. Um, our cloud platform at this point supports somewhere in the range of a few thousand microservices, which means that there is a lot of ways that things can go wrong. Uh, we run an, a dedicated support help desk and Slack channel for Atlassian developers to ask us questions. And so sometimes what I do at work is answer them. Um, sometimes they come to us with what looks like weird cloud stuff and I have to go behind the curtains and figure out what it is. The answer is DNS. The answer is, you always think it can't be DNS, but it's DNS. Um, the process of investigating issues in the cloud, or more stressfully, um, responding to an ongoing incident actively affecting customers is really kind of hard to describe in specifics. Um, although we do have a lot of tools that we use like Splunk and SignalFX that help with that. Much like debugging code, it's about problem solving and exploration and trying crazy things only to have some horrifying reality dawn on you. Um, I do actually find it can be a lot of fun. Um, it's really satisfying to be able to get to the bottom of a really gnarly problem and come up with a logical explanation for something that on its face <coughs> looks like dark magic. Or sometimes it's just an outage in AWS or some core part of the internet. Um, so those are probably the three main technical kinds of work I do. But there's a really important fourth thing that I do that is just as, if not more important than any of those. Which is, I spend a fair bit of my time just talking to people in one format or another. I think even today people undersell the degree to which interpersonal skills matter in software development. Um, to my mind, by far the hardest problem to solve building software is organizing people so that everyone is on the same page, everyone's invested in the same goal, and everyone knows what they need to do to achieve it. So I talk to people in meetings, over Slack, one-on-one -on -one while pairing on some task. Getting to know your colleagues helps a lot, and you really have to be able to work effectively and communicate ideas effectively with them if you want to get anything built. Occasionally, my calendar for a day looks a bit like this particularly ridiculous example. Um, there are, there are a whole bunch of ancillary skills that go along with that though, um, like project management, time management, and so on. What that looks like will differ a lot between companies. I would generally say that startups and small businesses are less likely to have a lot of formal process and project management, but that may not always be the case. And more structure isn't inherently good or bad thing. I know, I, I, I did actually add these in my calendar, by the way, because like, I'm not gonna go like Photoshop, Google Calendar, I had to make the events. Um, um, more structure isn't necessarily a good or bad thing, but I think different people thrive in different environments and thrive with different methods of organizing their work. And I think with that I've covered at a very, very abstract level the kinds of things that I actually do day to day working in cloud infrastructure at Atlassian. Um, it's all very abstract and high level. There's not a lot of like specific, you need to do this to get into cloud infrastructure here. Um, but I hope you got a little bit out of what it's like to build for the platform that cloud developers use. So mission accomplished. Well, we are actually almost at the end this time, but there is one more question that I would like to answer, which is, what about me? What about me as a uni student? Sure, the cloud is a huge part of industry. Why should I want to learn more about it? Um, I wish this had music. I've touched on this a little bit already, but I can see a few reasons why the cloud is kind of relevant for students interested in a, soft, a career in software development. And for people aiming at some other speciality like design or embedded systems, you'll still probably be using the cloud day to day and you may have to integrate your practice into a cloud product. If you're in embedded systems though, please, please rein in the internet of things, I'm begging you. Um, so here are a few reasons why it might be worth thinking. Um, whether that's by doing an internship, maybe personal projects, or just choosing courses that you need to teach similar underlying skills. So number one, it's an area that is constantly evolving and constantly changing. And there are a lot of really smart people working here on the kind of edges of computing. If you find technical problems interesting, the cloud is where you hit problems around scale that don't really exist anywhere else. I think you have a lot of scope here to learn interesting things, run into interesting bugs, and venture into new and uncharted territory. Second, the cloud is becoming relevant to more and more parts of the world. Most people now use cloud services of one form or another almost constantly. Like I, I originally had in this slide use cloud services every day, but I feel like that doesn't really capture it now. Most workplaces, even completely non-technical ones, rely on some kind of SaaS software um, to keep running. 
without keeping up with the cloud, it's quite hard to stay current on what's actually going on in industry right now. And finally, there is a perhaps more practical reason to engage with the cloud, which is that there are a lot of jobs in it. Um, cloud infrastructure specifically is a field that's really growing immensely, um, and companies that work with the cloud are, cloud are probably are basically constantly hiring people with that kind of skill set. Having some cloud experience um, on your resume, or probably more important than the resume, being able to talk about these kinds of things in an interview, does help a lot in job hunting. Although I should definitely note that, like. No company is going to expect somebody who has just graduated from uni to be an expert in the cloud. Um, everybody understands that that's not really taught at uni, it can't really be taught at uni. Um, I certainly had no experience at all um, from uni with it, so don't, don't get too worried about that. Um, but it can, it can be a really interesting and useful skill to get if you get it through an internship. And, well, speaking of jobs that might be relevant to students, um, at last is hiring interns. Um, for our penultimate year summer internship project. Well, last summer, I think we, I'm not sure of the exact number, I think we had somewhere over 80 interns, including a number from UQ, including yeah. at least one in the room, possibly more. Um, and I understand it's likely to be quite a large number again this year. Um, we're looking for students who are currently in their second to last year of their degrees, that is graduating sometime in 2022. And we're hiring for a program run over next summer where you spend 12 weeks working on a real Atlassian team doing real work. Um, I did actually do an internship with Atlassian myself, albeit quite a few years ago now. And I can say that I got a lot out of that experience, both in terms of learning from my team and learning on the work I was doing, but also building, building some really great social and professional connections with the people I interned with, many of whom work at Atlassian now and some of whom don't. Um, with a whole bunch of intern roles available, though, not just stuff in cloud infrastructure, not just stuff building cloud web apps. We have coding roles in backend and front end development, we have roles in security, SRE, and product management, um, as well as a whole bunch of roles in the design space, like UX research, um, prototyping, and product design. And I believe we are now offering intern roles in analytics as well, but I'm not too um, across exactly what that involves. Um, you can see the full list on our careers page, I hope hopefully included at the bottom of each of these slides. So, you know, why, why apply for an Atlassian internship? The main value proposition that I see in an Atlassian internship is that the work you do as an Atlassian intern will, intern will be real work. Our interns are embedded across the full range of Atlassian teams, and you'll get to learn from some really smart people with a lot of experience across a whole range of fields. Um, but there are some bonus features to the intern project uh, program as well that we think you would get value from, including events and activities specifically designed for the intern cohort, like um, brown bag sessions, which are just sort of learning sessions from disciplines across the company that will give you insight into the things that you might not learn on your specific team. Um, they do organize social events. In the past, there have been things like trivia, paint and sip sessions, and a whole bunch of other things. Obviously, last summer, due to COVID and border restrictions and everything, this was all done virtually. Prior to that, it was in person. Um, but yes, um, at least in the past, we've run an Ask Me Anything session with one of Atlassian's founders, Scott Farquhar and Mike Cannon-Brooks, um, giving you an opportunity to directly ask questions of one of Australia's tech industry leaders. Um, and you'd also get to be a part of a Ship It, which is a fairly core part of Atlassian company culture. A, an internal hackathon held a few times a year. As an intern, you can complete and ship it, do whatever you want, whether it's a complete mean project or something very useful, um, design something new or innovative. In the past, internship projects have done really well. I know of at least a few that have made it to the final round where you can present them to the entire company, and I'm certain that they have won before. Um, so the details of this, first, it's over the 2021-2022 summer, and as I mentioned before, we're looking for students currently in their penultimate year. So if you're graduating in 2022, this is kind of what we're looking for. In the past, the internship was on site in our Sydney office. Due to 2020 related reasons, this last summer it was done remotely. Um, I don't have a firm answer yet uh, as to what the case will be this year, because it depends a lot on local conditions, but the recruiting team will keep potential and accepted future interns up to date on what the go is going to be. One very important point that I definitely need to make. Yes, the internship is paid. Um, interns are paid a competitive rate. You're hired as casual employees, and you are paid for the hours that you work. Um, the internship program can function a bit like a try before you buy. <coughs> in that, it gives you a taste of what working at Atlassian is like, and a feel for both the company and the kind of work we do. 
The company does evaluate interns for grad positions, and at least in the past, this has meant that we don't do a like a re-interviewing process for grad positions if you just did an internship like some companies do. Um, really important to note though with this that like we do try and take an attitude to internships that they are really meant to be a learning experience. Um, we understand that people are coming in with a whole, like some people have done a whole bunch of internships before, some people have done nothing. Um, it's designed not to be about putting you under high pressure to show off and build something really cool. We understand that it's, the value is meant to be in the learning, so you know, it's not meant to be super competitive, I guess. Cool. So suppose you want to apply for an IC internship, what does the application process look like? Um, well, number one, you go to the website there and select the role you would like to apply for. Um, I will post details about this again later in Slack. Um, the first step then, we have an application screen which is, involves an online test followed by a phone screen with the recruiter. Um, before we move on to a set of technical interviews, we try to focus on problem solving, both coding and system design. We do try to make them at least a bit more realistic than sort of balance a binary tree. Um, some of them do involve coding, but we do, it, it is meant to be about problem solving, not about remembering one specific algorithm, I guess. After that, we do do some behavioral interviews on our values and one with the hiring manager who, uh, for your team, um, which will ask you about some situations you've experienced and challenges you've faced, both technically and interpersonally. And the step after that is the offer. Successful candidates have given a contract and further info to prepare for summer. And that's about all I've got for the kind of plugs part of it. Um, thank you for coming along to my talk. I would love to take any questions that you have about cloud <coughs> development, cloud infrastructure, what working for Atlassian is like, or about our hiring programs. Um, I will also be hanging around, um, and I am more than happy to chat with anybody who wants to ask me stuff a little bit more informally after this as well. If you do think of a question later, I do check UPCS Slack pretty regularly and feel free to direct message me if you've got a question you'd like answered or you'd like to chat about any of the things that I've talked about tonight. So um, thank you very, very much for listening to me for 46 minutes. And um, are there any questions at the moment? Should have prepared for this. Um, the food. Uh, yeah, other than the food. Well, I mean, I had well until recently. I wasn't working. I was working at home, so I didn't have the free like the, the free lunches. But um, I would say, for me personally, and this will definitely differ for different people in the company working in different roles. But I would say that on my team, I get to work with some people who are both really nice to work with. Like I would say, that I get along very well with my team but also people who have a lot of experience in different kinds of things. Like, in my team, I have people who have different experiences. They come from different places in the world. They come from different technical backgrounds. Um, and there's, like, you definitely learn a lot that you don't, you can't learn, particularly in a formal setting like uni. Like, you can only really learn things that are structured in a particular way, um, but, what I like about working at Atlassian is that I get the opportunity to gather information and knowledge from a whole bunch of different people's experience and, and <clears> get to apply that and get to interact with them on a daily basis to see how they solve problems. So that's probably my number one thing. Um, yeah. So you mentioned uh, it's good to try to get as much cloud experience as you can while you're at uni. Um, so I've heard about, um, I'm sure everyone has heard about um, AWS certifications. What's your take on those? Well. Certifications. Um, well, I have not done any. <laughs> um, those sorts of things can be useful. So, like you'll notice, I, I didn't come to a definitive answer on if I'm a UE student, this is how I get into cloud dev. And part of that is because, like, my own experience was that I did not learn about cloud stuff at uni. Um, and companies, when they're hiring, don't expect uni students or grad candidates, especially not intern candidates, to have that experience beforehand. Um, so it is kind of fine to go into it without a lot of experience. Um, but it can be useful. It can definitely be helpful when trying to find a job, and it can just be interesting. Um, certifications, 
I so I haven't done them. I have seen some of the, like the practice exams they have for them. Uh, for anyone not familiar with these things, so Amazon and I presume Google and Microsoft offer certifications where they'll give you some resources. You sit an exam and then you get a, like a, a an image on your computer that says you are an associate cloud developer with AWS or whatever. Um, Obviously, they have an incentive to get you familiar with their ecosystem, and that's why they offer these things. Um, they will not always be super realistic in terms of like if you go, you say like you learn about how to build AWS, like build cloud applications on AWS as Amazon recommends here, and then you go to Atlassian or you go to any other company. It's not going to be exactly the same, but it can be a good intro point. Even if you don't do the certifications, there's nothing stopping you from seeing all of the resources for them. Um, so I would say that that can definitely be a useful useful learning tool if you're interested in exploring the area. Yeah. Um, you said earlier that um, microservices had to be stateless, I think. Yes. But um, not having worked with microservices before, that seems like a difficult thing to do since a lot of programming you write does inherently have state. Can yes. you give an example of how you would write a microservice that would do something useful? That's a very good question. And the, the, the troll answer here is to say, write everything in Haskell. <laughs> but I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm just going to, like, I'm getting Slack notifications on my phone, like, did you mute Slack? <laughs> so the answer is I turn Slack off on the computer, so it's not coming up. Um, so that is a very good point. So being stateless doesn't mean you can't keep variables in memory. It means that you cannot keep anything in memory or on disk that you can't lose. Um, so for example, like um, you might have some, you might do like five things in the sequence of responding to a web request. It is fine, it is probably fine for the state of where you're up to in those five things to be stored on the node. Because if that node dies, the connection to the request is going to die anyway and I'll have to retry. Um, but you know, so we used a, I used an example of an e-commerce site before. Like, you shouldn't store the state of a customer's shopping cart in a file on disk on your service, because if that virtual machine goes down, then it's gone. Um, instead, what you do to actually do useful things is you use an external backing database service, so something like Postgres or whatever. Now, those are not like stateless microservices. So somewhere along the line, like Postgres or DynamoDB or MySQL is a stateful application. Um, but it's a stateful application that's kind of designed with specific level of failure tolerance and stuff. So rather than keeping stuff in memory or on disk, you write things out to the database if they need to be persistent. And there are like, so that 12 factor app stuff is kind of useful there. There are probably some links off of that that would give you useful information about like, patterns that you can use and things to avoid when writing microservices, because it is very easy to accidentally start adding state into your service. Um, yep. How do you like avoid concurrency issues when you have this microservices? Um, that is also a very good question. The answer is, I guess, primarily architecture. Um, if your microservices each do have a single clearly defined responsibility, then ideally there shouldn't be too much that can cause a race between microservices, which is not to say that it doesn't actually happen in practice. Um, I guess, you know, so it, it is generally considered an anti-pattern to do things like, you know, a naive answer might be you have these two services and they need to co coordinate with each other, but they need, you know, I'll just have a database that they can both write to and then I'll store a lock in that database. That's usually kind of considered a nanny pattern, things like sharing databases or sharing state between services. Um, instead, you should try to design the services such that if you have things in there that could conflict with each other, then they should probably be in the same service. Right. Or, you know, it, like, it's a very broad question. Um, at a larger scale, you may be able to have some kind of external locking service, like maybe a locking microservice or something that manages things. Um, Often, a, a, a common pattern for this is to use some kind of workflow engine um, that orchestrates making the other things happen in the right order. Like a queues. Yeah, so queues are an often, uh, often used pattern to, de to decouple pieces of functionality. So one thing talks to another thing 
via a queue and it picks up text messages off the queue and does things with them. Um, so I, mean, I talked a bit about cloud formation. Cloud formation is an example of something that can be used as a, as a workflow engine because it lets you say, I want to make this thing, but this thing depends on this thing, so this thing has to manage first, and it's kind of graph that's theory the stuff YAML. about that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we'll config. Um, there are a whole bunch of other systems out there that do that kind of thing um, that can allow you to make sure things happen in the right order and don't um, conflict with each other, I guess. Um, but it's a very complicated topic, and it is the kind of problem that you will run into a lot in the cloud. <laughs> yeah? What is your favorite Atlassian SaaS product, and why is not there confidence? I know. What a question there. Um, now, that is a hell <laughs> look. I obviously cannot choose favorites. And on the plus slide, I don't work on any specific product. So at least I'm unbiased. Um, in terms of what I actually use most of the time, I definitely do use Jira and Confluence a lot. Um, I'm going to give a, um, an interesting answer and say that I actually quite like our, some of our like more technical products, like um, Bitbucket, the Bitbucket server, and Bamboo, which is and the Bitbucket pipeline, which are CI CD services. Um, I use Bamboo a lot, which is really complicated, can be quite painful to configure, but it's actually really powerful. Um, and I appreciate that it has a lot of, like, I have not found too many things where I've run into a wall of I need to do this, and Bamboo will not let me. It almost, you always can be configured to do um, to do what you needed to do, it just not, might not be pretty. Confluence is my favorite. That's good to know. I'm glad, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear you like confluence. Documentation is key. Another question. Asking for a friend, if you got the uh, Atlassian hacker rank test, what would your tips for doing that be? <laughs> well, um, first off, I have not seen the Alassian Hacker Act test that is currently given to students, so I do not have the knowledge to share specific insights with it. Um, the thing about Hacker Act tests is that they are very much a very, they are a very rough screen. I mean, I personally like I, I think they do a very poor job of really getting at somebody's underlying knowledge, um, but they are they can be a useful kind of first filter. Um, I think it is important with those to pace yourself, understand how they work. I don't know how the Atlassian one works now. When I did it, it was like a points-based system, so there were like five questions, and, and by the way, when I did it, it was for my internship, so that's a, quite a long time ago now. Um, points-based system, so it was like, I definitely did not get every question on that test, but I did get sort of like, you can prioritize your time with the points and stuff. Um, Hacker rank test specifically, it's very difficult to give tips for because they are automated. Um, I can give much more useful tips on the actual technical interview parts because when you're talking to a human, that human is actually evaluating you, you know, based on criteria, but they can like get a better picture of what you're actually, your thought process is, how you're communicating. And in technical interviews and behavioral interviews, I think it's really important to treat it not as like an exercise in getting to the one right goal, I need to balance the binary tree, do things in this specific way, so much as treat it as a way to show the interviewer how you think, how you communicate, um, and what you do when things go wrong. Like, don't panic if you have a bug in your code during a coding interview. Use this as an opportunity to show that I know how to use a debugger, or I know how to insert print statements, I can think logically and come up with a solution. That's a very good question because, to be honest, there's not much that is directly relevant um, in terms of like the specific technologies that I work on day to day. I would say the, the courses that I found most important at uni, or that have influenced me most, are honestly the more abstract ones. Um, in terms of like, you know, yes, like theoretical concepts and data structures. Not that I use right algorithms and data structures stuff all the time, but like. It is important to know those things as a sort of baseline. Um, 
when working on systems so you can spot when things are wrong, when something is like, this is obviously wrong, this is obviously inefficient. Um, and I think those also are just something more well-rounded. I, I was, the answer I always give to what was my favorite course I did at uni was, I think, Math 3306, which is completely abstract and is not relevant directly at all to day-to-day -day work, but as a course that's kind of on that boundary of maths philosophy, it's sort of more teaching you how to think about things in a very abstract way, and those are very applicable. The other answer to this is um, things about teamwork, but I feel like the uni kind of group project teamwork is a very artificial model of teamwork. It doesn't really reflect very much how things work in the real world. It is very important to get those interpersonal skills, but um, like if you hate team projects, don't worry, working in the industry is not really very much like that. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> um, what's, what's one of your favorite projects, personal projects that you've worked on in the past? Um, well, Personal projects or projects that I have personally worked on? To be honest, I don't really do much in the way of personal projects now that I um, work as a software developer because I don't really feel the need to do write code every, every hour of the day. Um, in terms of specific projects that I have worked on, um, you know, I, most of my work at Atlassian has been so, something around the, um, around the paths. Uh, one that I got the opportunity to work on last year was we, we have this idea of progressive rollouts. So the idea that you know when you deploy a new version of your stateless microservice, you can cut traffic over to it gently and roll back if things go wrong. And we had previously like we had previously built this whole weird custom method method of doing this based on scaling up numbers of nodes and then the the requests coming in based on the number of nodes would get to one randomly and that would kind of wait it. And then suddenly AWS announced this feature, like like that they, like just out of nowhere they were like, you can set weighted rules to send things to things. And we're like, whoa, <laughs> we don't have to do all this weird shit anymore. <laughs> um, and so I got to be a part of ripping all of that old stuff out. I know it sounds weird, but deleting code is very fun. Um, ripping all this old stuff out and replacing it with something that was much simpler, much easier to understand for people coming back to it later, and that frankly worked much better, and um, which definitely prevented some like internal incidents and stuff. So that was quite interesting. Cool. And uh, what what is this dead game that you work? Dead game that I work. Yeah, I was just looking. At oh, you. looking at you're looking at my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Oh no. Um, so that is a personal project I worked on. Absolutely nothing to do with Atlassian. Um, I used when I was in high school. I played a lot of a game called Tribe Descent, which is a. So it was a good game, but it was very dead. Um, and because it's not, it doesn't relate to the cloud, because like most games these days, it is a SaaS product. Um, you they host the servers. You don't do anything. You just open a game client. The problem that I see with this model is that as soon as they try to shut down the game servers, it's dead forever, nobody can ever play it again. This has happened to many games. Um, so one thing that I did work on as a personal project, which I haven't done for a couple of years, was working with a couple of other people to do things like write a clean room implementation of the master server for the game, um, which means it is now possible to spin up an EC2 instance and then host a game server of that game, which is took a lot of work. I learned a lot of things doing it. I learned from the people that I was working on it with. The game is still dead, but at least it can technically be played. So. <laughs> so. Cool. Thanks very much for coming along, and I will be sticking sticking around. So feel free to um, just come up and chat if you'd like afterwards as well. Thank you.